A.W. Tozer once said, an honest man with an open Bible and a pad and pencil is sure to find out what is wrong with him very quickly. <laughs> the story of the Bible is a story about redemption. It's a story about a creator who loves his creation so much that he redeems us out of our own filth, our own brokenness, our own hopelessness and despair. It's, it's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's much more than that. It's a true story about love and grace and redemption. And it's full of all sorts of colorful characters who do all sorts of crazy things out of their own brokenness and hopelessness and despair. Uh, in fact, the world then sounds a lot like the world today. Because as I often say, although human culture constantly changes, human nature never changes. At our core, we're the same across generations and cultures. And so the same brokenness and dysfunction that existed in human beings in centuries past still exists in people today. Right? The, the, the details of our circumstances may be different, the setting may be different, the culture may be different, but the underlying brokenness that is at the core of our dysfunction is exactly the same. Which means the solution that was needed for those broken lives then is the same solution that's needed for broken lives now, which is why the Bible is as relevant today as ever, no matter how ancient the stories may be. Right, because humanity's greatest need never, ever, ever changes. People are broken because of sin, and there's only ever been one cure, the love and grace and forgiveness that we find in Jesus Christ alone. And so, although costly, the answer to what ails humanity is not complicated. Right? Religious people and religious leaders in particular over the centuries have tried their best to make it complicated, but it's not. What Jesus has done for us, as profound as it is, it's not complicated. And yet the reason more people don't embrace it is not because they can't understand it. It's because they don't understand why they need it. Because lost people don't know they're lost, not until Jesus reveals himself to them. The Apostle Paul was a murderer and a persecutor of the church by his own admission, yet he wrote, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. According to Paul, before Christ in our lives, we're all dead in our trespasses. Dead people don't know they're dead because they're dead. Lost people don't know they're lost until someone shows them the way. The Apostle Peter rejected Jesus in a profanity-laced denial just before Jesus was crucified. Later, Peter wrote this about himself and about us. He said, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times. Why? For the sake of you. First Peter 1, 18 through 20, Jude, the brother of Jesus, who along with the rest of the family before Jesus' death and resurrection, publicly accused him of being insane, doubting he was actually the son of God. Jude later wrote this to the church. He said, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and have mercy on those who doubt. Have to believe he was thinking of himself, Jude 21 and 22. These were all men who before Christ in their lives, they were very good at sinning. These guys were like overachievers when it came to doing the wrong thing. And yet they embraced the gospel and although they still made mistakes, there was still sin evident at times in their lives through the redeeming work of Christ in their lives. They literally went on to change the world for the sake of Christ. But listen, it's only because of what Jesus did in them. Right? Paul was a powerful influential leader long before he came to Christ. Peter was a successful businessman long before he came to Christ. Jude seemed to be doing just fine as far as we can tell long before he believed in and followed Christ. All of these men were getting along quite well for themselves. They had it good as far as this world was concerned long before they came to Christ. The circumstances of their lives before Christ, the context they were living in was quite favorable. They had it good. Yet, we wouldn't even know their names today or anything significant about them at all if it wasn't for the work of Christ in their lives. 
In fact, if after coming to Christ, they had tried to continue living their lives as they did before coming to Christ, what kind of impact do you think they would have had on this world? Right? Everything uh, meaningful, everything lasting, everything that truly made an impact on the people around them and generations since was only because they abandoned who they were before Christ, embracing who they now were in Christ. It wasn't until they traded in their past life, their past identity, even their past achievements, as good as so many of them were, for the infinitely superior new life in Christ. It was only then that they discovered their true worth, which is also when they began to discover what they were truly capable of. Right? And yet, before any of that could happen, they had to first recognize the fact that they were lost and in need of rescue. And again, the human condition is the same for us today as it was for them then. That's why you need Jesus. Because you cannot and will not ever fully discover or embrace who you are or what you're capable of until you fully discover Jesus Christ and embrace your own desperate need for him. Listen, no matter how good your life may ever be on this earth, I mean, some of us have it good, right? No matter how favorable your circumstances, no matter how much your life seems to be going your way at any given point along the way, you need Christ when you have everything. As desperately as the lost, blind, and broken beggar who has nothing. Your need for Christ is as desperate on your best day as it is on your worst. For you say, I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3.17. Jesus said that to the church, to people who thought they had everything they needed because they were living in prosperous times under favorable circumstances. And so that's what they put their trust in, their confidence in, their hope in, without recognizing their desperate need for him. We do well to heed these words today just the same because as we'll see in our story as we continue working our way through the book of Revelation, Satan isn't the reason people reject Jesus Christ. You know that? Satan isn't the reason people reject Christ. Hard times isn't the reason people reject Christ. Injustice isn't the reason people reject Christ. Evil leaders, morally bankrupt cultures, broken societies, your family upbringing, none of those things are the reason people reject Jesus Christ. No, all of those things can be temptations, but the reason people reject Christ is because we are all, every single one of us, born into sin, and it is from within, from inside ourselves, from our own fallenness, our own sinful nature that we reject him. Jesus said what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. This. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Matthew 15, 18 through 20. That's why no matter what's going on around us, listen, good, bad, or indifferent, we need Jesus just the same. Because as John Calvin said, the heart of every human being is an idol factory as we'll see in our story today, okay? Your need for Christ is as desperate on your best day as it is on your worst. Let's turn there together then and pick the story back up where we left off last time at Revelation chapter 20. We'll begin with the first 10 verses. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark in their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. 
And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So an angel descends from heaven with a key in his hand to the abyss and a great chain to bind Satan with. It's probably Uh, We don't know, but it's probably the same angel who is in chapter 9, releases the demonic locust by opening the shaft that leads to the abyss. Interestingly, uh, this abyss is referred to in lots of other places, both in biblical scripture, uh, Jude 1.6 and Luke 8.31 are two examples, but also in extra biblical writings as well. I just read in the book of Jubilees, chapter 5, verse 6. It's an ancient Jewish work considered, by the way, to be biblical canon by some elements of the Orthodox Church. It's in there as well. Uh, And what you find in these references is that the abyss was commonly understood at the time as this giant cavern, this subterranean cave underground deep in the earth that was a holding place for demons and fallen angels and unclean spirits, and at least in this instance, Satan himself. And so the angel seizes Satan and binds him with a chain and throws him into the abyss for a thousand years. Why? So that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. That's a really important point that we're going to come back to because the purpose of this confinement is not to punish Satan. That comes later. Okay, This binding of him in the abyss is expressly for the purpose of preventing him from deceiving the nations during the thousand years, which is why the abyss is also sealed shut. So more on that in a moment. And then there are people who believe uh, that we're currently living in uh, the millennial reign. It's a theological view called amillennialism, which is the idea that Jesus' first coming has already bound Satan according to his work on the cross and has also brought God's light to the nations as referenced in Matthew 4, uh, Luke 2, Acts 14 and 17. Therefore, they argue that this binding of Satan for a thousand years refers to the gospel's spread among all the nations during the present age and the present restraint of the church's persecutors until a widespread outbreak of rebellion just before Christ's return. And if you believe all of that, I love you and we can still be friends. Uh, But I don't personally subscribe to amillennialism for several reasons. First of all, Satan's work of deception clearly continues today. His influence in no way has been restrained as it would be if he were bound in the way this passage describes. In fact, Peter said, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, watchful. Your adversary, the devil, does what? He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Doesn't sound like someone chained up in a pit. No, the, the work of the enemy is alive and well in our world today. And furthermore, the early church nearly universally believed in an earthly historical reign of Jesus Christ initiated by his physical return. In fact, it wasn't until Augustine and the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformation theologians with them who adopted the fourth century, it's a guy named Tychonius, his interpretation of the millennial reign as being only a spiritual in nature, not physical. And so that's the start of amillennialism when it started to become popular. So again, if you go back to the early church, it was widely understood that a physical earthly reign of Christ would be initiated upon his second coming. And finally, it's the physical earthly reign of Christ upon that second coming that's plainly taught uh, throughout the Old and New Testament. Psalm 72, Isaiah 2, uh, 2 through 4, Isaiah 11, 4 through 9, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, Luke 1, 32 and 33, Matthew 5, 18, Luke 19, 12 through 27 are just some of the ones I jotted down. There are many other passages. In fact, in all of Scripture, there are more than 400 verses. That, just in the Old Testament, there are more than 400 verses and 20 different passages uh, that deal with this time when Jesus Christ will rule and reign personally over planet earth okay and if you read the prophecies about the millennial reign in the bible such as isaiah 2 1 through 5 and many others we know that this will be a time of perfectly administrated and enforced righteousness on the earth and so although there will still be conflicts 
between nations and individuals. There will be no more war as those conflicts will be justly and decisively resolved by Jesus and those uh, that he is appointed to reign with him, as we just read. And then John describes two resurrections. First is a resurrection of blessing, power, and privilege for the saints of God, all those who are dead in Christ. And the second is the rest of the dead, those who are dead in their sins, those who are not blessed and remain under the power of the second death and who have no privilege. And these two resurrections are separated by the thousand-year reign of Christ. Jesus talks about it in five, uh, John 5, 28 and 29. He says, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And yet, as wonderful then as this thousand years will be, we also know that during that time, with all of the peace and all of the prosperity under the perfect rule of Christ, that there will still be those who personally reject Jesus as Lord, as we see in some of the prophecies, including Zechariah 14 and Micah 4 and others, and as evidenced by those who readily turn against God and his people the moment Satan is released. Uh, As Robert Mounts puts it, apparently a thousand years of confinement does not alter Satan's plans, nor does a thousand years of freedom from the influence of wickedness change people's basic tendency to rebel against their creator. And so whether it's unbelievers who survived the great tribulation, as uh, many scholars claim, or those who were born during the thousand-year reign who choose to reject Jesus, maybe it's both. We don't know. It doesn't matter. Because either way, there will be those who spend entire lifetimes living not only under the perfect rule of Christ, but also without any evil influence by Satan in this world who will still choose to reject Jesus. Think about that, because I've heard more people than I can remember say, well, if there truly was a loving God who's sovereign over this earth, then why would he allow evil to exist, right? The argument is if there was no external evil influence in this world, then sin wouldn't happen and everyone would then be more than willing to follow your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, just maybe. Maybe this is the very reason, whether in part or in whole, that Satan is released from the abyss for a short time. Because even after living under the perfect, sinless rule of Christ in a prosperous world full of peace and protection and health and safety, people still reject him. And to further prove the point, the moment Satan is released back into the world, the majority of the repopulated earth after a thousand years, whose number, John says, is like the sand of the sea, those who've known nothing but perfect peace and prosperity under the rule of Christ willingly, eagerly, by their own choosing, join Satan to make war against Jesus and his people. And of course, it isn't even a battle because no sooner do they surround the camp of the saints in the beloved city that fire comes down from heaven and consumes them and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So why go to all the trouble of binding Satan for a thousand years only to release him to then destroy him and all those who follow him in one great act by the hand of God? I believe, I personally believe it is at least in part to answer once and for all those who accuse God of being cruel and unjust and unfair and uncompassionate. Uh, David Gusick puts it this way. He said, in this we see more of the important reason God has for the millennial kingdom and allowing this final rebellion. For all of human history, man has wanted to blame his sinful condition on his environment. Of course I turned out the way I did. Did you see the family I came from? Do you see the neighborhood I grew up in? With the millennial kingdom of Jesus, God will give mankind a thousand years of a perfect environment with no Satan, no crime, no violence, no evil, or other social pathology. But at the end of the thousand years, man will still rebel against God at his first opportunity. This will powerfully demonstrate that the problem is in us, not only in our environment. As the Lord says through Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. You see, Satan isn't the reason people reject Christ. Hard times isn't the reason 
people reject Christ. Injustice isn't the reason people reject Christ. Evil leaders, morally bankrupt cultures, broken societies, your family upbringing, none of those things are the reason people reject Christ. Now, the, the reason people reject him is because we are all, every one of us, sinful apart from Christ. Sin comes from within. And so even in a perfect world, our hearts are inclined to sin. That's why you need Jesus. Okay, Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world at the beginning of this age, and yes, they were tempted by the serpent, but he didn't force them to sin against God. That was by their own choosing. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. We're never forced to sin. And it's the same in this thousand year reign of Christ at the end of this age as we see here. And it's been the same at every point uh, in history in between. King David had everything a man could ever want. Money, power, respect, family, and God's greatest blessings in his life. And yet in an instant he turned his back on on God by uh, committing adultery and murder. Because no matter your circumstances or your environment or your station in life, your need for Christ is as desperate on your best day as it is on your worst. It's a theme throughout the book of Revelation. In fact, we talked about it uh, all the way back in chapter 8. So we'll talk about it again here today. The fact that people throughout history and throughout these end time events are given opportunity to repent over and over and over and over again and to live under the blessing of God, and yet they willingly choose to reject him. Listen, whether they're living under his blessings or his curses, I mean, we see here under the thousand-year reign, people turn and reject Christ. We've seen over the past several chapters under the wrath of God being poured out onto the earth, opportunity for them to repent and come to Christ, and yet they still reject him doesn't seem to make any difference. Because without Christ, until we recognize our desperate and utter need for a faithful, righteous, holy Savior, we're without a hope in this world or the next, no matter how good or how bad our lives seem to be. Just look at the state of the world today. The depravity, the corruption, the the abuse of leadership, the rejection of God's perfect will, and look at the acceptance by large portions of the church today of every socially acceptable behavior, even those we know are detestable to God. And that's just in the church. It's the very problem we find during this thousand year reign, people who allow Christ to rule over them, but not in them. He's Lord over their lives, but he's not Lord of their lives. And of course, the problem with that is Jesus doesn't want a part of you. He's not interested in a part of you. He wants all of you. Okay, look, God didn't plan your life long before you were born and then form you in your mother's womb and then send his son to die for you so that he could occupy a portion of your life. Yet a lot of times we treat him that way as a provider, a healer, a protector, a friend, without ever recognizing him as our Lord, without ever truly knowing him for who he actually is. In fact, When he describes that final judgment day in the gospel according to Matthew, he leaves no middle ground when it comes to the lordship of Christ in your life. Either you're completely under his rule or you've completely rejected his rule. There's no middle ground. Even for the most religious, the most moral, the most spiritual people among us, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? These are people who profess to be followers of Christ. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I never, I never knew you. You understand, it's what Jesus wants, is to know you, and he wants you to know him as Lord. And of course, it's not so much that people don't want to know Jesus today, we just want to know him on our own terms. We, we want Jesus as a part of our lives more than we want him ruling over and in all of our lives. Often we're more interested, I think, in what he can do than we are in who he is. Listen, here's an experiment. Ask a believer, a Christian, Who is Jesus to you? I guarantee you most of the time, the answers you'll get will be along the lines of Jesus is my friend, Jesus is my provider, Jesus is my healer, Jesus is my savior, Jesus is my protector, 
Jesus is the one who gives me peace and on and on. Of course, we all want that Jesus, which is not wrong, by the way. But notice every one of those descriptions focuses on what he does rather than who he is. What you won't very often hear when you ask a Christian the question, who is Jesus to you? You won't very often hear someone say, well, Jesus is my master. Jesus is my ruler. Jesus is my king. Jesus is my Lord. Who did Jesus say would enter the kingdom of heaven? The one who does the will of my Father, who's in heaven. In other words, the one who is under the lordship of Christ. Why? Because doing the will of the Father is a function of knowing Jesus. It's not what gets you into heaven. It's proof in your life that you know and are known by the only one who can. That doesn't mean you'll be the perfect Christian, by the way. But it does mean there will be no part of your life that is off limits to him because you've submitted all of it under his rule in your life. Right? To say that Jesus is my peace, my protection, my strength, my provider, those descriptions are wonderful. But they say nothing of our own lives in relationship to him other than the fact that he does great things for us. And yet when you say Jesus is my Lord, well then you're announcing to the world that your life is submitted to his because of who he is. So yes, it's important. Of course it's important to recognize all that he does, but how much more important that we recognize who he is, which is why when Jesus returns to this earth, there's only one name that the Bible says will be written on his thigh. We just read it last week in Revelation 19. It isn't peace giver or healer or protector or provider or friend. No, there's only one name that is inscribed on his own body, and that is the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why? Because that's who Jesus is. And it's only then, when you not only recognize him for what he does, but actually know him for who he is, that you begin to understand the hopelessly unspannable chasm between you and God without Jesus. No matter how bad or how good your circumstances or station in life may ever be, the fact remains your need for Christ is as desperate on your best day as it is on your worst. Charles Spurgeon once said, when we think too lightly of sin, we think too lightly of the Savior. Let's finish our story for today. Verse 11 to the end of the chapter. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, So now we come to the final scene, uh, the the scene of final judgment, where John sees a great white throne and one who sits upon it. It's much like the description found in uh, Daniel 7, where the Ancient of Days uh, takes his seat upon a throne flaming with fire to execute judgment upon the kingdoms of this world. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. In other words, there's absolutely no hiding from this throne, nor can anyone escape the judgment that it represents. And although, look, Christians uh, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive their rewards, or lack of, according to what we've done with the life he's given us, as we see described in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Romans 14, uh, 1 through 12. In other words, just as there are degrees of punishment for the wicked, there are degrees of reward for the righteous. However, that's not the same judgment seat as the great white throne uh, judgment that the wicked will experience here in Revelation 20. In fact, Uh, Interestingly, the word used for judgment seat in 2 Corinthians 5.10 and the reference in Romans 14 referring to the judgment seat of Christ, that's the word bema in the ancient Greek. Bema in the first century, it was a raised platform that judges at athletic games sat on to view and judge athletes. So their job was to make sure the contestants followed the rules and then they would hand out the awards to the victors, the trophies or whatever it was. So the bema was never a place of... Uh, reprimand uh, or a way to punish the athletes in any way. It was always a place of testing and reward. And so in the same way, the Bema of Christ will not only be a place, uh, uh, not a place of condemnation or censure for Christians, it's a place of reward in varying degrees depending on how well we've run our race. 
As again, Mount says, the issue is not salvation by works, but works is the irrefutable evidence of a person's actual relationship with God. Salvation is by faith, but faith is inevitably revealed by the works it produces. And so in contrast, this judgment before the great white throne at the end of the millennial reign is something altogether different. And it's not a trial, by the way, um, in order to determine what the facts are. Now, the facts are in. The great white throne judgment is the sentencing of those who are already condemned by degrees of severity according to their works. This is the second death, while those whose names are written in the book of life are granted eternal life, which, by the way, has absolutely nothing to do with our works. You see, at the great white throne judgment, unbelievers will be judged according to what they've done. Believers will be judged according to what Jesus has done. That's why you need Jesus. Because on that day, he will make a legal claim on the life of everyone who has placed their faith and trust in him in spite of what we've done. Remember what the Apostle Paul said about this? We read it last week. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans 8, 2 through 4. Jesus paid for something that you never could. Your sin and the price of death that must be paid for that sin. He paid it for you and in doing so, he made a legal claim on your life. And it wasn't because of what you own or what you earn or what you have to offer him. No, he made that claim on your life solely because he loves you. All of the indebtedness of your sin has therefore been paid in full. You understand what that means? Do you understand what that means? You no longer have to pay that debt. And so now if you're a Christian, if your life truly abides in Christ, then every sin you've ever committed has been paid for. What about the sins I'm struggling with right now? They've been paid for. Okay, what about every sin I'm ever going to commit? It's been paid for. He never meant for his people to carry the weight of sin in this world, so he made a legal claim on your life so you wouldn't have to. And yet, because mankind rejected him all the way back in the Garden of Eden, the burden of sin was thrust upon this world, which is now a broken place full of spiritually dead people because of sin. The Apostle John said, The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John five nineteen. Paul said, You are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. The world's a broken place, full of spiritually dead people, lost people who don't know they're lost. And so Jesus came to change that, which is why he said the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19, 10. So now, within this world, this broken place full of spiritually dead people, you have the church, this family, made up of people who were once spiritually dead but are now spiritually alive in Christ. And if you keep reading that passage in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, again, say, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He bore our sins so that we no longer have to, so that we are no longer judged based on our works, but on his his works on our behalf. That's why he was able to say, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. He bore our sins so we no longer have to. See, God never wanted you to carry the burden of sin. And so recognizing our desperate need for a Savior, the unspannable chasm between us and Him, He sent Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He bore our sins for us. And so now because of Jesus Christ, you don't have to. In fact, the only thing you have to do is recognize your own desperate need for Him. Listen, no matter how good or how bad your life may be going for you right now, 
Your need for Christ is as desperate on your best day as it is on your worst. And so all you have to do to have your name written in the book of life is recognize your own desperate need for Jesus and in repentance submit the rest of your life to him. And listen, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. No matter how bad you've been or how grand it may be going for you along the way, no matter the state of your life yesterday or today, I'm telling you all that matters is right now. Because look, uh, Paul, Peter, Jude, they were all successful men according to this world before Christ. They had it good. Yet at the same time, Paul was a murderer. Peter was a liar. Jude was a betrayer, and Rahab, she was a successful businesswoman. She was also a prostitute. Queen Esther was an orphan. Ruth was a destitute pagan widow, and yet every one of them was not only redeemed from all of that, but they all went on to literally change the world, and I'm telling you, so can you. And it all starts by simply recognizing and admitting your own desperate need for Jesus. Sinclair Ferguson once said, my security as a Christian does not reside in the strength of my faith, but in the indestructibility of my Savior. Okay? The entire Bible is a story about redemption. It's a story about a creator who loves his creation so much that he redeems us out of our own filth, our own brokenness, our own hopelessness and despair because of love. And so he sent his son Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves because no matter how good our lives may be, listen, no matter how successful you are or prosperous or put together your life may seem to be today, no matter how much you may think you've got this all figured out, please hear me, no matter how religious you are or morally conservative or generous or compassionate you may ever be in your life, no matter what you accomplish in this lifetime, there is nothing you can ever do to earn your way into heaven. That's why you need Jesus. Let's pray.